the beautiful part when biology and, and, and physics come together, mm -hmm. uh, there's an opportunity for personal empowerment. Mm -hmm. Well said. That, that's incredible. I love seeing the uh, the similarities, even though there's a few different metaphors. You're seeing yeah. the same thing, yeah. and that's that's great because it reaches a larger audience, it reaches more people. Yeah. I just want to ask a question around um, epigenetics and modifying your avatar. How your your consciousness modifies your your biology, yes. your body follows, and so how can how does that work? Because like I was saying, I tried. Like, hey, I tried EFT, I tried hypnosis, all these different things to kind of get into the subconscious so I can make that change. Yes. Um, I'm failing at that. So maybe. maybe <laughs> well, there's a, there's a couple of reasons why you might be failing at that, Vanessa. And one, we exist on, most of us exist on kind of two levels. We exist on an intellectual level and we exist then at, at our core kind of at a being level, our intuitive level, if you like, uh, our feeling level is kind of the being level. Well, those two levels don't always have the same attitude. They always don't have the same direction. And your intellect may be saying, I want to change. I want to uh, be different. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to learn these other things. But, I want to lose 20 pounds. That's yeah, I want to lose 20 pounds, right. I want to do whatever, you know. So your intellect can say all those things. And your intellect can mean it, but just because your intellect thinks it, that's like making a wish. It doesn't carry a lot of force. Where you have to have the change is at that being level, at that intuitive level, at the level of feeling and the, just the level of who you are at your core, not your intellect. So I think what happens is that most of us, yes, we'd like to lose weight. We'd like to eat better. We'd like to do all these kinds of things. But it's, we, that's what we think we should do. And we're doing it because our intellect says, that's a better thing to do, and we should do it. But if we're not really committed to it, if we're not really doing it from the core of ourselves, then nothing much happens. It's just an intellectual game, which is a very weak game. Now, if at the very core of your being, you know, at your being level, at your feeling and intuitive level, if there's where your mind is made up, wow, things happen very quickly and very powerfully. You know, I've known any number of people who, let's say, wanted to quit smoking cigarettes. And they try and they fail and they try and they fail and they try and they fail. And that's because they thought they should quit because people don't like their bad breath. People don't like the smell on their clothes. People don't like breathing their smoke. So they think, well, people don't like us. I really should quit. But that's different than really wanting to quit. You see, there's a difference of thinking you should and actually feeling like you must. That's something that's core to you. So those are the differences. And I've seen other people who have smoked their lives decide that they're going to quit. Do it at a fundamental, intuitive, basic core level. Walk away from those cigarettes and never smoke another one. Never have withdrawal never feel like they want a cigarette. They just walk away and they're done with it. And the difference is one's an intellectual thing that's trying to force your way to do something that you're really not that interested in doing because it's too much work or you don't know how or some other reason. But when the core of you decides to make a change, then the change happens. And just like the lady who had the cancer, you see, intellectually she could say oh i don't want this cancer i want to live and i want to do this and i want to do that but she's got all this fear and all this stuff you see that's really at the core of her that is creating the problem but once she gets to that core once at her being level she offloads all that fear then stuff can happen fast and powerfully because that's where your ability to modify the future you know the future probabilities that connects from your being level. So that's why so many people try things, they take courses, they go read books, they just do all this stuff, and they're so disappointed because nothing really happens. That's because it's all an intellectual game. They're making wishes, they're not really making changes. <laughs> changes have to come from an intuitive level. It has to be you. You know, it's like the difference in, you know, being kind and acting kind. Well, anybody can act kind particularly if other people are watching. 
you know, other people are watching and we all act very nice and we're very polite. But the difference is that one of the, one of the persons, the one that's being kind, really is kind, period. He doesn't have to think about doing the right thing or helping people. He just does it because that's the way they are. No thoughts about it. But if it's just because you've learned politeness in your culture and you say, well, okay, you know, there's a little old lady, I'll help her. I'll, here's a lady full with harm, full of packages. I'll open the door. I want to be helpful. I want to be whatever. But you're doing it because you think you should, because you've been trained, because you've been taught. Well, that's civilizing, but it doesn't help you grow up any. It's not really powerful. It doesn't change reality. But once you get it at the being level, yeah, you can go from stage four hopeless cancer to cancer free overnight. You know, it doesn't take much time. That's the difference. So yes, you'd like to do these things and you read about them and your intellect says, yeah, I want that. But you're not yet convinced at a being level to let go of the fear that you have to let go of in order to actually make it work. There's these fears that you have and, you know, like you're trying to be a better person. Why? Because you probably have a fear that you're not really as good a person as you need to be. So it's that fear that's driving it, not really you becoming the better person. It's the fear that you're not such a good person that makes you want to try real hard to act like a better person. Acting is different than being. So and, uh, the example of, of like wanting to lose 20 pounds, I've traced it back and I'm like, well, I, maybe the fear is the fear of, uh, I'm trying to protect myself and I don't want anybody to get close. Yeah. So if I have an extra 20 pounds. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. There's some fear in there that, that likes that extra 20 pounds and doesn't want to, doesn't want to let go of it. And that's the fear that keeps it there. And you can die it all you want, but you will always sabotage yourself and and not get there but the day that you decide you really want to lose it you'll see that you know weeks later you'll lose it your mind is a very powerful thing it really can change reality you know in the physical system uh, particularly the reason it can change the physical system so well like in biology is that in the physical system there's so much uncertainty there's so much choice like bruce says you know, you have a gene, but that gene has thousands of ways of expressing itself. There's all of this choice. And where you have choice, now you can modify future probability with strength. Where you have little uncertainty, everything's kind of buttoned down. Now it's more difficult to modify things with your intent. But biology is a wonderful place because there's so much choice, so many ways that it can go together, so many possibilities so much uncertainty that what will happen because you know people get stage four cancer and are hopeless and get over it i mean that happens all the time it probably happens you know to a couple of people you know every day okay they're still the 100th the one percent but it happens all the time biology is a immensely uh, variable thing and that makes it the perfect candidate for the mind to change it to manipulate it well, the, 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 this is uh, uh, also recognized in biology and the fact that when we talk about the mind, uh, there's almost a singularity, the mind. Uh, and the fact is, no, there are two interdependent elements to this mind. Uh, one of them is the uh, right behind your forehead prefrontal cortex is the latest evolution of the brain. Uh, and this is the conscious mind. Uh, this is the one connected to our field, our source, our spirit, our identity. 90% uh, of the brain is the subconscious mind, which means it operates without any thinking involved. It's habit. Conscious mind is creative. Subconscious mind is habit. Now, the interesting part about it is, is the habit part gets programmed uh, uh, into your brain uh, the first seven years, you're in a state of theta brain function, which is hypnosis. Uh, and that's how we download basic behaviors of how to be a member of a family and a community by observing all those people around us, our parents, siblings, and community. And these are downloads without going into conscious mind. They go straight into subconscious. Okay. Now, now the problem about it is this 70% of those downloaded programs are deemed to be uh, disempowering, self-sabotaging, limiting behaviors. And you say, okay, but I don't need to operate from subconscious because I can use my conscious creative mind to create that heaven on earth or whatever I want to create. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, this is really good. 
Now, except here's the problem. The conscious mind also is capable of thinking. I said, well, what's the relevance? I say, the conscious mind can drive the vehicle creatively. And I say, if I ask you what you want out of your life, wishes, desires, aspirations, that's a creative expression of what you would like. Mm -hmm. I say, if the conscious mind's driving the vehicle, then it's going to engage neurological behavior to move toward that destination. Mm -hmm. But here's the failure. Uh, 95% of the day, the conscious mind's engaged in thinking. And I say, why is that relevant? Because thinking is an inside job. If I ask you, tell me what you're doing at Sunday at two o'clock, you have to go inside and go, oh, uh, you're trying to picture where, where, what am I doing on Sunday? I go, ah, oh, here's the issue. And this is the crux of the whole problem uh, that we've all been talking about here. And the crux is this. When I'm conscious, I have my hands on the wheel. I'm driving my vehicle toward wishes, desires, and aspirations. But when I'm thinking, I have to let go of the wheel because I'm going to go inside and process now. But I say, yeah, but that doesn't mean I stop everything. If I have a thought, I just stop. I mean, I could be walking down the street and have a thought and continue walking or driving the car and have a thought and I'm still driving the car. I go, well, then who's driving and who's walking? Well, my conscious mind got busy inside. And the answer is subconscious is autopilot. The moment mm -hmm. conscious lets go, programming takes over. Well, if my programming is negative, <laughs> then that means when my, I'm thinking and the behavior that's coming out of me at this moment, I'm not observing it. And the simple reason is why. Conscious mind's inside. It's not seeing what's going on outside. So whatever behavior is playing when I'm thinking, generally I'm not paying attention to it because I'm inside. Uh, and then when you find out, well, 70% of those downloaded programs you're operating from are disempowering and self-sabotaging, and all of a sudden you say, oh my God, 95% of the day, my device, my avatar is on like a habit control. Uh, it's under subconscious behavior. Why? Because my conscious spirit uh, is busy thinking, so it's not paying attention. Uh, and I say, well, why is it relevant? Because then it says about 95% of the behavior that you do every day is not even visible to your conscious mind. I go, why is that relevant? I say, well, if most of that is disempowering or self-sabotaging and you don't even see it, then all you see is the consequence that I had wishes and desires, conscious mind, wishes and desires, but my life is not manifesting them. And then all of a sudden they feel like a victim. Why? Well, I wanted to be successful and it's not working. It must be the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out, no, 95% of the day, you're shooting yourself in the foot with these bad behaviors mm -hmm. and you don't even see you're the one with the gun. So at the end of the day, you come home and you go, boy, universe is against me. It's not in my nature to be successful because I went forward this morning with great wishes and I come home with nothing. Uh, and, and therefore, mm -hmm. This is the problem of the world, to my point of view, mm -hmm. is take that and understand this, then everyone feels they're victims. Why? Well, I wouldn't have created this mess <laughs> if I, it was up to my consciousness. I wouldn't have done this. And I go, mm -hmm. but you're not operating from consciousness. 95% of the day you're operating from program. And since other, put, other people put the program in, uh, then you're not even operating from your wishes and desires. You're operating from their programs. Uh, and, and this is like why if a child gets adopted into a family with cancer, guess what? The adopted child will get the same cancer as the family siblings get. But the adopted child has totally different genetics. What was the point? Cancer isn't due to genes. <laughs> the, less than 10% of cancer is even connected to heredity. It's cancer is epigenetics. Uh, uh, as Tom was bringing about, if you have a negative aspect of life and that's your perception, you're going to adjust your genetics to express negative. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the point again, uh, the function of the mind is to take uh, that program and make it real. Now, if you got a negative programming, but you don't see it because you're thinking and the mind is going to work with that program, it's going to manifest it, whether it's mm -hmm. negative or positive. And since most are negative, then we look at the world as a life of struggle, as victim. We give up our power because if you feel you have no power, you will pay anybody anything to protect you when you feel so vulnerable. When in fact, 
as an emphasis again on Tom, uh, that he says, we are creating this. If you don't like the creation and you understand the mechanism, you can change your creation. Yep. If you don't understand it, you are whatever the program is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with with uh, with all of that. We just use different terms, but it all yes. it all comes out to be <laughs> about the same thing. Yeah, you know, I talk about the fears. You know, you have all this fear inside you, and it the, that fear dominates ninety eight percent of all your choices. You know, those choices you make, they're they're because of the fears you have inside, and that's what you're calling the programming. Uh, uh, absolutely, that's that's where we got it. Yeah, uh, and that, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, that, Tom. Do, that dominates, and. Um, and then you have uh, an ability to kind of rise above that. Uh, absolutely. And so as you mentioned to Vanessa, you said, well, you know, if there's a weight issue, uh, you have a conscious wish. I want to lose 20 pounds. I say, that's great. How much is that working during the day? 5%. I say, well, what's mm -hmm. happening 95% of the day? The, the point is, why did you get the weight? And Tom, you brought <laughs> that out. You said, because at some point, that was maybe a means of protection that if I'm heavy, people will leave me alone and, uh, and I won't be a victim. So your subconscious is going to save your life by what? Keeping you overweight because that's the program. I got to protect myself. Right. And the conscious mind's going, I don't want this weight. And I go, yeah, well, 5% of the day is not going to change the 95% coming from the program. Yep. Yeah, it all works out. However you say it, it all works out the same way, doesn't it? <laughs> that, that's, well, that's, a, that's why I like working with you, Tom, for a very simple reason is like when you really want to learn something, the more different ways you put it into the system, mm -hmm. the, the, the greater the opportunity to, to make that change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. like hearing it, seeing it, writing it, smelling it, tasting it. Every yeah. time an input comes in that reinforces it. So uh, you and I are having a, a wonderful time. Why? Yeah. We're giving the same story from a, you know, a slightly different vocabulary. Why? Because your vocabulary is physics. My vocabulary is biology. And right. yet, both of them at this moment in time are complementing each other. And that's the beautiful part because physics is the more valid of all sciences on this planet. And uh, biology is conforming to it. Yeah. Well, yeah, physics is at the root, is at the root of things. But, you know... Diversity is important because there's a certain group of people who will hear it expressed in terms of biology and can get it better there than if they hear it expressed in terms of physics. And there's another group that's just the opposite. And there's other groups that won't get either one of those, but they'll get it from some yogi that, uh, you know, is telling them things. So it's, we need this diversity. It's important. It's not that we should all hash it out and come up with one story. No, we're all different. We all. Thank goodness. Yeah, Thank we need goodness. to approach it from uh, yeah, thousands of different directions because that opens up opportunities for lots of different kinds of people to get there. So Absolutely. It, it's tremendous that we have so many different ways of saying the same thing. And, you know, I'm fond of saying that there's only one truth. Just one truth, but there are thousands and thousands of pathways that will take you to that truth. Yes. And they're all valid and they're all important and uh, they all are part of the solution. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's why I love that man because he can, <laughs> he can say good stuff. <laughs> 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 you guys, before we wrap it up, I don't want to, I kind of feel like I'm left hanging, like, yeah, okay, it's the fear, it's the fear, you know, but like, how do I get rid of the fear then? Like, what do, what do I do with it? What do I do well, with it? it's, it's another part of the same thing. You can't get rid of the fear just by wishing it away. If you just say, well, I just don't want that fear. Well, okay, but that's not going to change much. Again, you really need to get committed. You need to get down to where you in, in Bruce's language, you need to get rid of that programming. In my yeah, language, exactly. you need to get rid of that fear. You know, <laughs> you, you need to get rid of the basic fear that is driving your choices. And once you get rid of the fear that's driving your choices, now your choices can be made and you can change your life much more easily because you're taking your life back rather than let your fear drive the boat or drive the car. You're in charge. Right. You're taking responsibility for everything that you're doing, and that's the difference. So how do you get rid of it? 
thinking about it and making a plan isn't going to do it. You're going to have to change the way your perspective. You have to change the way you look at yourself. You have to change the way you look at reality. You have to change your whole perspective on life to where that, that programming, that fear, you see it for what it is. And you kind of go beyond it. You don't let that control you. You get rid of it. And you can't just let that stuff sit in there and ignore it. You actually have to get rid of it. You've got to get into the programs and rip them out by the roots and get yeah. rid of them. You can't just wall them off and say, well, all right, I'm not going to pay attention to that anymore. That won't work. You got to rip them out one by one until you get rid of each one of them. And every time you rip one out, you feel empowered. You feel more in charge. You feel more responsible because now you're not just a zombie going through life because, you know, doing what your fear tells you to do. So that's how you get rid of the fears. You have to really want to enough to work on it to find out what is that fear? What is that program that's running you? Identify it, grab it, tear it out by the roots and get rid of it. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's a lot easier to say than it is to do. But still, you can do it if you have a, an intent that is consistent and you steadily keep your mind focused on getting rid of it, it'll go away. You will get rid of it. So well, that, that's, that's that, how you, you do it. And that's a hundred percent agree with it on Tom, but I also have to add this is that the two minds, the conscious mind connected to that personal identity, that spirit field or whatever you want to call it, uh, the creative mind uh, learns in different ways than the subconscious mind, which is the habit mind. Uh, and you're right, 95% uh, of the day, if you're going to be playing habits, I don't care what your conscious wishes and desires are, the 95% the of the day is going to still play the program. And as you said, Tom, you have to take this program out and rewrite it, replace it. Uh, and yet you have to recognize this, is that you would have to do it in the manner that subconscious mind learns. Uh, because that's how you want to teach it. Uh, uh, and conscious mind learns because it's creative in any number of ways. You know, listening to us this talk right now can change conscious mind. But it doesn't change the habit mind because habit mind by definition is resistant. Otherwise, it's not a habit. A habit means it's like I got the program and that's my program. If it changes every day, then it can't be a habit. So a habit mind learns in different ways. And then when we learn how to rewrite the programs in the subconscious mind, that's when those fears that you talk about can be eliminated and replaced with much more positive programming. But we must recognize uh, just having a, a positive thinking in your conscious mind is not necessarily or easily in any sense going to change a program. You actually have to engage a different behavior and that's, the, that's why the failure of the system is like, oh, I'll just think different. And I go, I don't care if you think different. That's conscious. You can think different all you want 5% of the day, but you're going to still play the exact same programs that you got 95% of the day until those programs are changed. Uh, and this is what Tom is talking about, eliminating the fear, is you must rewrite the limitation programs that we acquired uh, in the first seven years of our life. Mm. And what do you think is the collective program uh, for the human condition that is perpetuating this victim mentality? I, I think what's perpetuating is that there are people who know that I can program you. And when I program you, I own you. And that's the name of the game. The Jesuits have said for 400 years, give me a child until it is seven and I will show you the man. They actually knew this mechanism that it was seven years of programming and that whatever that seven years of programming is, 95% of your life is going to come from that program. Therefore, give me the child until it's seven. I will show you the man is they already knew you're going to play this program uh, until you change it. That program is yours for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. If I had to comment on, on kind of, if you're looking at the, the big picture, all the people, you know, all humanity together, I would, I would say that, um, and this is in complement to what Bruce says, and that is the reason we as a whole are the way we are is an individual thing. There's nothing that's going to change us en masse. There's nothing that's going to, you know, nobody's going to wave a wand and suddenly we all become enlightened. It doesn't work that way. Right. It works one person at a time. Everybody has to find that inner truth, that, that you know, 
that themselves. They have to root out those fears, you know, get rid of their programming. Uh, they have to do that one at a time, individually. You can't rip out anybody else's program. You can only rip out your own. Exactly. You're the only person you can fix. So that's how you change the world. If you want to change the world, you start by changing yourself. The only way that you can help somebody else change their own programming, get rid of their fears, is to give them a safe, secure, caring, non-judgmental environment. If you give them that environment, that makes them, that gives them at least a, a higher probability that they can reach out and grab those programs and get rid of them. They can deal with that fear because they're in a safe, nurturing place. So if you can give other people that safe, nurturing place, that will help them get rid of their own fears. But you can't get rid of their fears for them. No. They have to do it. And until they take that responsibility to do it, we will continue to live in a world very much like the one we live in because right. that's the way we are. This world is a reflection of us and it right. has to happen. I mean, we have to get over it one person at a time. Basically there's no big thing and nobody's going to write a book that has all the answers to it. And then everybody reads it and suddenly we're all enlightened. Wow. It doesn't work that way. No. It's not what's in our intellect. It's not, you know, from reading the book, it's from, it's at the being level. It's who we are. It's those, those programs and those fears. That's, you don't get that from a book. You only get that from serious internal work and effort because you want to get rid of it. So that's uh, kind of that's kind of the key. And we we share because we we interact conscious to consciousness. We have this collective consciousness. If you're in a world where 90% of the people are victims and sad and unhappy and struggling and not satisfied with who they are and, and life, well you tend to take on that mopey attitude too, because you're in this soup with all of these people who are dysfunctional, unhappy, you see? Whereas if, if you keep company only with people who are, who are very positive and you know, have great outlooks and feel like the world is terrific, and well, that kind of pulls you up too. So we have this inertia, if you like, that's part of the problem. The feedback we get from each other is you know fear i mean all you have to do is go on the internet and you can find if, if there's anything possible that somebody could be afraid of there's some group of people <laughs> somewhere who you know are are talking about it and beating those fear drums and making it as scary as possible fear is everywhere and that affects us so we pull each other down so it's make it even more challenging for us to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps to let go of that fear, get rid of the programming and be authentic. That's a tough challenge. Like I say, real easy to say a lot harder to do, but it can be done if you really take it seriously and you really want to do it. So I'd like to just uh, emphasize uh, uh, what you just said there be before we sign off, because it was so important and I think people should hear it again. And that is you can change yourself but you can't change somebody else unless they want to be changed. Uh, and this is very hard because when we have loved ones and you, you see them going off the track and you're gonna put so much energy to try to get them back on the track, if they're not ready to get on the track, then that energy is just wasted energy. So we really mm -hmm. have to look at this as an individual basis. And Tom's right, you, you can fix yourself and you can make suggestions, but it doesn't mean you can change anybody else and that will help us because so much frustration comes from seeing loved ones not being in the right place mm -hmm. uh and then having a personal uh human heart that wants to to help and then realize look it won't help until they are ready to change mm -hmm. right and you can get into that boat particularly with family like you say particularly with loved ones and that can bring you down because you're so frustrated that you know, you just want to take these two people and knock their heads together and say, <laughs> stop fighting, you know, stop this, this dysfunctional behavior. And of course, they don't see it that way. And uh, if you let, if you feel, um, if that makes you feel bad or is a downer for you, well, then that's a problem. And that becomes part of your own problem, part of your own fear. 
And you have to realize that you're not in charge of the world and you're not in charge of other people. You have to let other people be who they are. That everybody here is struggling. They're doing the best they can with the beliefs and the fears and the programming and all of that stuff that they've got. And they're struggling with it. And that struggle is their natural feedback. When the pain gets to be enough, maybe they'll see a better approach. And yes, you can offer suggestions and yes, you can provide alternatives, but you can't make anything happen until they do it themselves. And that, yeah, you can, you can, you can be, you, you can, I, I guess what you need to be is not part of their problem. Because you see, if you go to those two people and you say, stop it, folks, you're both dysfunctional. You're both just, you know, doing negative stuff. And, you know, it's all your, your programming that's causing that. What you will do is make it worse for everybody. It'll be worse for them because now they're going to retract more into their, into their beliefs because you, you confronted them and you're going to feel bad because, you know, you can't help. And now they're both angry at you and, you know, it just makes everything worse. So you have to get to the point that it is the way it is. People are the way they are. Love them, care for them, give them support, show them a better way, be a good example. But otherwise, Focus on yourself. You've got plenty to work on. <laughs> you don't have to go out <laughs> helping other people before you, you start working on uh, your own issues first. Thank you, Tom. I so, uh, I so appreciate being once again with you on this, and I so appreciate your wisdom. Uh, uh, it's so important for all of us to, to really get this uh, and work with it. Vanessa, I want to thank you for uh, letting me be in this uh, community and talk to all those wonderful cultural creatives out there that are looking for uh, the better way. The answers to life is uh, uh, let's create something different. And Tom's, uh, Tom's words are, are super critical in understanding the nature of that creativity. Mm -hmm. So thank you both very much for, for this opportunity. Well, thank you, Bruce, for coming and, uh, and joining us. It's always great to get another perspective and another set of metaphors and ways of looking at a problem because it gives people a much bigger perspective. And uh, that's good. You know, the more yeah. people that we can share this kind of message with, then the more, the more we're part of the solution. I love that. And love that's, that. that's basically what it's all about, right? One at a time. You, uh, we help other people see a bigger picture. Yeah, it's, it's neat though. You know, right now I'm, I'm tied up with a bunch of physics experiments that are going to show that this is a virtual reality. Yes. And it's to me, you know, I've, I'm doing all this physics stuff, but the real core, the stuff that really matters is really the stuff we've been talking about. I mean, physics is nice, but you know, it's better to understand that this theory is not just science. Oh, science, okay, let the scientists take care of that. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with me. You know, well, it does. This is a, this is a piece of science, the stuff that, that uh, Bruce is doing and the stuff that I'm doing and a lot of other people are doing. It is science and it does have to do with everybody. It has to do with all of us. It has to do with the quality of your life, whether you're miserable or whether you're happy. You know, it has to do with basic things like that. Are you in charge of your life or is your life in charge of you, you know? And uh, it's, it's important, but it does make sense. It is good science and you can do physics with it. It's better physics, but uh, physics, isn't the, physics isn't the big thing, even though I'm a physicist. Just like for you, I'm sure biology isn't the big thing. The big thing is letting <laughs> people know that they're not in a trap. Exactly. People know that they have, that they have control. They're not, they're not locked into a, to a, you know, a, a lot of things happening to them. They can take charge. And that's really the, the message that uh, is important to get out to the, to the average person. Mm -hmm. So thank, thank you, you, for, you for putting that out there and, and sharing this with everyone. I hope we don't wait five years again to, to <laughs> um, I hope we can do this again soon. Yeah, I wish Bruce didn't live so far away, but he's out on a mountaintop out uh, on the coast and uh, I'm up in the woods of my little hangout on the edge of a mountain and uh, it, uh, we, don't get to, we don't get to meet very often. So this is particularly uh, nice that uh, get to share a little time. Long lasting, Bruce. long lasting, as I know from the last time, there's mm -hmm. still, uh, our words are still out there. So uh, that's a, a, you know, a, a great expression of uh, the, 
the power of what you're saying and how people are, are holding on to that truth. So, um, but I just really wanted to say thank you both. Thank you, Tom, for your time. So important. And Vanessa for putting us together and making this work right. Absolutely. My honor. You're welcome. And for Bruce, taking the time out of your schedule to come and talk with me. Yeah. Thank you. I love to talk with you here now. <laughs> thank you so much. And, uh, and uh, I hope people listen to this guy on my, on my video screen on my right, <laughs> my dear friend Tom, because his words are, are wonderful truth for the world for us today. Thank you all. Mm, thank you, thank you Bruce. Bye. Bye. Bye.